Hello, Atlanta Nation. Thank you for watching the Laws of Attachments. <clears throat> this is a presentation I gave in Las Vegas at the AACA convention in June. And I dive deep into my theory of attachments, give you some uh, rules and principles to follow when thinking about when to use what attachment. And it references some great uh, Invisalign forefathers, um, John Morton, Scott Frey, a few others, and one of my mentors, Randy Kunick. And if you uh, like what we're talking about, you can dive a little deeper with those guys. Um, I also want to emphasize something that is very important to me, and that is access to aligner education. And it's just my theory that the more we contribute and collaborate, the more we all grow, and there's just not enough out there. And if you feel like there should be more free Invisalign uh, education available on platforms like YouTube and Facebook, um, please like, comment, and share. And this is the you know, equity I get is when you guys share and enjoy this stuff, it makes me want to do more. So please enjoy the Laws of Attachments. Thank you much. So how many of you guys get clinchecks from Invisalign that look like this? Attachments basically on every tooth in the mouth. Why does it look like this? Why are we getting clinch checks back like this? And is this a good clinch check? That is kind of a quick trick question because we don't have a picture of the patient. We don't have images. We don't have x-rays. We have no idea what this patient's uh, concerns are or their diagnosis is. And that is the key. Invisalign clinch check algorithm is constantly advancing and it is an amazing sophisticated piece of software but it doesn't take the patient's face and concerns into consideration. And when people are doing direct-to-consumer products like you know, many of the ones advertised out there, they aren't either. They're using the scans or models of teeth to try to move teeth without attachments in IPR, without understanding a person's diagnosis and concerns. So yeah, maybe this is the right clincheck for a patient. But we know that if we have attachments like this on a patient that are placed by the Invisalign algorithm, and that is trying to torque these roots to the distal, which means they're trying to get these midlines to match up. But you know, if you studied Bill Robbins and, and if you looked at facially driven diagnosis or global diagnosis, we know that the position of the central incisors is more about where they fit in the face and less about how they relate to the lower arch. So this could be a great clincheck. It, we don't know. But if it is not, if the end result does not put the teeth in relationship to the face in the right place, then we know we don't need these double spike attachments because it's much easier to tip the crowns to the left. If we're torquing the roots to the patient's left and not tipping the crowns to the, excuse me, the roots to the patient's right and the crowns to the patient's left, um, then we don't need these double spikes at all. Randy Kunick, who's been an amazing mentor to me, an orthodontist that's willing to train and teach dentists, and I hope has benefited greatly from it, has said this in his lecture called The Reference Tooth. He says that when you begin an Invisalign case, you start with a facially driven diagnosis. You look at all the information, you look at the x-rays, you look at the periodontium, and you determine the teeth that don't need to move first. And then you right click on a ClinCheck and you make them unmovable and you reverse engineer the case from there. You determine the easiest ways to move the teeth that have to move. Now this concept, if you understand this and grasp this, you will save yourself so many refinements, I call them revisions if you have to change the outcome, but a refinement you can prevent if you get the diagnosis right and only move the teeth that have to move. So important. So let's get into attachments. <clears throat> Real basic overview, what is an attachment? It is a projection of plastic off a tooth that's bonded onto the tooth at the beginning of a, a Invisalign case to help affect the uh, force systems on a tooth. Some movements cannot be accomplished without attachments. And those movements, for example, are extrusion of a tooth. Plastic cannot extrude a tooth without an undercut for the plastic to grab onto. It'd be equivalent to a uh, picking up a wet watermelon seed with your fingers. Patients don't understand that sometimes. It's a hard thing to grasp. And when you are looking at a direct-to-consumer product that doesn't have attachments, there's no way that they could extrude tooth, 
um, to bring it down and there's really no way that they could get certain root torques accomplished and things like that. You need attachments to get the specific forces on teeth. There are different sizes and shapes. Invisalign's been doing a lot of research for the last 22 years to determine what the best shape is to get the right forces on a teeth, on a tooth. It's a very sophisticated science. And um, they look like this on the ClinCheck, on our planning motor, uh, protocol, and in the mouth, they look like this. Very hard to see, slightly translucent. This tooth has a little excess on that you can see. There's a little staining around there. Patients can feel them especially these spiky ones that project off the tooth. Those are teardrop attachments. Um, so we need to know why they're there, whether or not they're needed, and we need to be able to educate patients what to expect. You know, there are pros and cons to attachments, certainly. It is also important that every Invisalign provider and professional knows what the attachments are there for. Why did the algorithm put them there? You need to memorize this. It's very easy to find. Just Google Smart Force Attachments and Features by Invisalign. That's the title of the PDF. You will find it. And it has a list of every single attachment, what it's there for, um, why they're put on, what uh, the different generational movements are, the G6, G7, G8, what the conventional attachments look like and why they are the shapes that they are. This is simple and it has to be memorized. It's only three pages. Um, there are also updates to this constantly, and so we have to be abreast of the newest and best attachments out there. So please memorize that and understand those things. Um, if you want to understand a little bit more about why different attachments are shaped different ways and why certain attachments are better than others, um, John Morton published a video, and it's called The Innovations of Invisalign. It is hard to find. Um, I recommend going to Aligner Nation. It's a Facebook page that... Uh, a few of us uh, lining professionals host and Jeff Skinner posted this video, John Morton video. I think it is the single best uh, resource to understand why attachments are used and understood. John Morton is brilliant and has done more aligner research for Invisalign and other companies than about anybody else I've ever read. Please check that out. Um, the newest addition to attachments are the uh, large optimized attachments. I do want to make everyone aware of this. That was not put on the smart feature um, slide that just came out about two months ago. Let's go back to this. Um, and this is what they look like. They're larger. The idea is that the active surface where the dimple is, where the plastic engages, is bigger and there's a bigger relief for the tooth to move into. Bigger uh, is better, as we say in Texas. And um, hopefully this will allow more force on the teeth and more predictable movements with these attachments. I've been reading and studying in the last 12 years since I graduated different techniques in aligner science. I was trained in 2006. A lot of updates have come out. A lot has been written. A lot of it is hidden behind barriers. You either have to be a dentist or an orthodontist or spend a ridiculous amount of money. Um, to understand it. And I feel that uh, it is ever growing skill and science and we are still writing these textbooks and they quickly become outdated. And I think it's important that everyone have access to these things if they want it. Some of the more influential pieces of literature in my experience have come from uh, Dr. Barry Glaser's book, The Invisalign Treatment. He's an orthodontist, has been open to training professionals. Uh, Sandra Ties was helpful. And uh, Dr. David Galler has been a tremendous influence on me with his uh, re-engage course and his Tip Tuesdays. Um, but a lot of this stuff's hard to get, and it's kind of hidden. Is there a best way to do it? There's a lot of different theories out here. Every one of these books propose new ways to do ClinChecks, and I've applied these theories to different cases. And sometimes um, Barry Glaser's techniques are better than Dr. Galler's, and sometimes Dr. Galler's are... Uh, the best and, and Warner Ships. Um, he got some great advanced techniques in his book. Um, it just depends. And it depends on your practice and depends on your patient and what they can tolerate. Those uh, books and uh, that literature has influenced my theory and has also influenced these laws. These are five laws of attachments. Um, and I kind of reference where I learned them and, and I'll give praise where praise is due. <clears throat> Number one, 
law of attachment is you place anchorage attachments on bicuspids. This is Dr. Galler and Dr. Glaser. They um, talked a lot about this in Dr. Glaser's Ten Commandments of uh, Invisalign. And you do that unless you have natural anchorage from teeth. I'll go into that more. Law two, you use smart attachments when you need them for specific mo tooth movements. And that's John Morton, and he's got lots of science to back this. And I say that you use munchies to amplify those specific movements. Number three, use optimized support attachments when you are extruding upper laterals. And number four, you use power ridges for lingual to torque on non-contiguous teeth. Dr. Glasser talked about this in his Ten Commandments, and I'll go into that a little bit more. And last, you use the template aligner to put on smart attachments only. Guys, first law, anchorage. This is a common presentation in my office. You notice very few attachments on this case. I don't have the full clinch, this is a slide, but you see that the lower arch were intruding the anterior teeth. Oops. And we have deep bite protocol attachments, optimized extrusion attachment on a uh, first bicuspid, and the aligning has these uh, thermoplastic features with dimples on it to get actual intrusion of the teeth. And these are the magic trick here, the secret sauce, the sexy um, rectangular beveled attachment, horizontal rectangular beveled attachment on the bicuspids for anchorage. That's the key here. And in my opinion, anchorage is a make or break feature. It is the ability of the plastic to be anchored, locked onto the teeth, so that you have maximum uh, aligner touching intimacy to the teeth to get the right force systems. All right, so rule one is anchorage, the horizontal rectangular bevel. This is what it looks like. Um, they're standard on almost all my cases. I put them on there to get aligners to lock onto teeth. You'll notice patients, they can eat with them, even sticky food, because the plastic is locked under those undercuts of those uh, beveled attachments. And I've been debated many times on what the position of those attachments should be. If you look at this case here, the bevel is facing the incisal edge. And some people say, well, it's better to put the incisal or the bevel towards the gingival margin and have the, um, the undercut and the other vector. And to them I say, cool, whatever. It doesn't really matter. For anchorage, we're not trying to get a specific vector of force on the teeth. We're really there to get the plastic anchored on the teeth so that we can get the plastic to do what it does best on the other teeth. So for bicuspid attachments, um, it doesn't matter. If you're trying to be nice to the patient and they have natural undercuts in the teeth and other teeth and you have a good adaptation of the terminal molar and you get a undercut on that molar, the plastic kind of anchors down there, there by itself. And I tell you to put the bevel towards the gingival so when the patient is taking the aligners out, it slides off. This is kind of an abstract concept, but if you have the, the undercut right here, it locks on and patients can even like break their nails sometimes trying to pull them off. They're really anchored on powerfully. So if you have undercuts, the terminal molars or natural undercuts in the teeth, you do not need to put the bevels um, towards the incisor like this. Um, so the debate about which direction to put them is the wrong debate. The bevel can be towards the gingival edge or it can be towards the incisal edge uh, depending on if there is natural undercuts elsewhere. What are the exceptions to putting HBEV on teeth? Well. Um, number one, um, if you have a lower incisor intrusion, like this case, you want to put an optimized attachment, not an HBEV. And um, that is written in the G6 protocols from Invisalign. Check that out. Another exception is when there is natural undercuts in teeth. And where do you get natural undercuts? Um, teeth that are perio-involved, where the CEJ is exposed, there's natural undercuts there. Or if there is a missing tooth on the patient's arch, that arch gets a ton of anchorage from the plastic wrapping in the undercuts from the missing tooth. And if you put HBEVs on all the bicuspids and have those undercuts, the patient will have a miserable time removing their aligners. And that decreases the patient's experience. 
and our goal is to provide the optimum patient experience. Get my little picture out of the way here. Other exceptions not to place anchorage attachments. So rule one is about the anchorage from uh, natural to shape. Rule two, the other reason uh, not to place HBEV attachments is the moment of force needed to achieve a specific movement, let's say a rotation movement on a bicuspid, um, is a reason to use an optimized attachment and not an HBEV. A smart attachment for a specific movement outranks a smart attachment. So for example, let's go back to that picture. If I were trying to rotate this first bicuspid, I would allow the algorithm to place an optimized rotation attachment instead of a HBEV attachment. Hope everyone understands that. It's an important concept. All right, rule two, respect the smart attachments. Use smart attachments for specific vectors of force and only specific vectors. Now the algorithm will automatically kick on and tell you um, when a optimized attachment is needed. For number seven, if you look at the tooth movement table, there is a, um, there is a 26.1 degree mesial rotation. And so they put an optimized rotation attachment on that tooth. And my advice, if that tooth does need to rotate 26.1 degrees, you follow the advice of the algorithm. These teardrop attachments, that means that number six is extruding. It also means that it is rotating because a teardrop attachment does an extrusion and rotation. Now, Invisalign's algorithm wants to put perfect canine guidance on every case and look like perfect denture teeth, but sometimes that's not in the patient's best interest. I look at this case and I think that the incisal edges of eight and nine, they need to be even with number six, but it looks like it's a little fangy, a little long. I will go in, double click, eliminate that vector of movement, verify that I do in, in fact need a, a mesial rotation, and often I will uh, eliminate the optimized or the teardrop attachment. If I still need the extrusion, then I'll put an extrusion, optimized extrusion attachment. But oftentimes I'm eliminating these attachments and the rotation attachments depending on the patient's uh, diagnosis. That's the key. The double spike has to do with root torquing. And if you look at this tooth, number nine has a 5.1 degree mesial tip torquing. And you need to see if that is actually what you need. Um, if I'm tipping the crown mesially, that means that I'm torquing the root distally. In this case, I don't really think I need to do that. And actually this is set up to, I'm sorry, to do a mesial root torque, torque the root mesially. It is completely unnecessary based on my initial assessment here. I would double click that, zero it out, see if that is a better uh, treatment plan, and then remove the double spike. These are some abstract concepts, and I know it takes some practice. Basically, I determine what teeth need to move and how I'm going to move them based off the uh, Holy Scripture here from Dr. Gallard Ostriker, the Go Acceleration Chart. This was built on the backs of a lot of um, aligner science, a lot of other uh, research by people like Morton and uh, I. Stryker and Dr. Gallard certainly consolidated it to this amazing um, single page reference. And it, I go into this on crushing clinch checks a little bit. Try to look at this and understand. If you have questions, comment, uh, share. But any tier one movement, you don't need attachments for, period. Tier two, attachments certainly help. Um, <clears throat> and you want to make sure you change aligners at least seven days to 10 days. If you're using a munchie, you can, tier two movements can go back to tier one. And tier three movements, you certainly need help with. And sometimes um, attachments will help. Sometimes you need more than that. Sometimes you need to use Propel or um, an accelerator to accomplish those kinds of movements. And then sometimes, you know, root torque is simple. If you have great anchorage and it's a young patient and you don't need to pray. So every case requires uh, understanding of the patient's diagnosis. And this is a great framework to apply to every case, but doesn't mean that um, you have to adhere to it like a blackjack cheat sheet.
and that's the ex example I like to use. To go into more about smart attachments, I want to um, reference something Scott Frey, an orthodontist and the owner of the Orthocosmos, published on his blog. And Scott Frey has a lot of great information. Unfortunately, it's not available to many people unless you're an orthodontist. And I got to give him credit for these slides. I do have access to these, and these are excellent. He shows heat maps, basically showing where the force, uh, moment of force is coming from with plastics. And I'll go into this slide in more detail. But I want everyone to understand this, why, smart, why we use certain smart attachments and only use them for certain movements. Well, smart attachments were well tested. John Morton tested those. And he showed that they increase the biomechanical force systems and the predictability of certain movements. He also um, helped design each shape of every smart attachment and he tested them, tested them on over 10,000 cases um, using big data from Invisalign scans and Invisalign impressions. He was able to see which ones worked better. And it's a constantly growing group of data. And I don't believe that any other aligner system out there has that kind of data and is usually a decade or so behind um, every other clear aligner system is behind what Invisalign is doing because of the information that they have in data. The description of these movements is available online. Um, they are not customizable manually. You have to, uh, they have to be put on by Invisalign's ClinCheck algorithm and the algorithm automatically puts them on based on the tooth movements prescribed to teeth. And munchies improve the eff effectiveness of certain attachments. And munchies can be found at eocaamerica.com. Let's look at this Scott Frey slide. So what this showed is that there are certain um, attachment designs. Here you have a horizontal, a bevel up, bevel down, and you're trying to do a mesial root tip. And what that means is the tip of the root, imagine this tooth is long, you're trying to torque the root mesially. And all of these attachment designs, we see that the moment of force is on the gingival distal third of this canine and with very little uh, engagement on this attachment. And what this diagram showed is that of all these different attachment design, uh, designs, Maybe this double spike design here, you gained a little bit on the attachment, but all in all, the moment of force was unaffected. And another thing we found that these regular attachments is these regular attachments may actually interfere with certain moments of force. Now you imagine uh, you get a root torquing moment on this uh, gingival third. You also get a little moment on the attachment in the opposite direction. And additionally, if that tooth does not track, and then the attachment is bulging out of the tooth, pushing the plastic away from the teeth, you will get a reduced moment of force. So what this slide basically tells us is it doesn't really matter what the regular attachment design looks like, and that they all get the same um, moment of force just from the plastic alone, unrelated to the attachment. I find that very interesting and intriguing. Uh, John Morton published this slide. Uh, actually, this is Scott Frey again, but John Morton did this study and he showed as well that uh, optimized rotation attachments outperform um, no attachment and conventional attachments consistently. The extrusion of different molar features is the same. And again, this is Scott Frey from Orthocosmos blog. Um, it's pretty resounding that the studies from A. John Morton and B. Scott Frey, that the optimized attachments outperform every others. Moving on, <clears throat> optimized support attachments for extrusions. Some of you have heard the saying, uh, luck the faterals, pardon my French, um, but Lateral incisors can be difficult to move based on their size and shape, and they are literally, look, they look like watermelon seeds, and aligners have a difficult time engaging these. Um, the optimized G7 support attachment looks like a little smiley face. In my opinion, has been the best solution to 
uh, extruding lateral incisors. They are also very good at intruding central incisors. And they provide a downward vector of force adjacent to this big tooth that is getting an upward vector of force. And you get an optimized intrusion vector. So if you are intruding a central incisor, or extruding a lateral incisor, I like this optimized support attachment. Dr. Galler um, in his Tip Tuesdays has a um, hierarchy of optimized extrusion attachments, and he said that the <clears throat> optimized extrusion, uh, optimized support is the greatest, followed by an optimized extrusion, which looks like a little skateboard ramp, followed by an HBEV, um, or the order of um, magnitude and greatness. These can only be triggered by the algorithm. You cannot place these yourself. You gotta tell Invisalign to put them on by um, extruding the tooth. Here's a little key tip. Um, when deciding whether or not to put an optimized extrusion attachment on a lateral, you need to first look at whether or not that movement needs to occur at all. And what I'm finding in my practice is that many times the gingival height, gingival height uh, zenith here is more important than the incisal edge. Some patients want the incisal edges to be flush. What I would encourage is get the gingival zenith flush, right place, and use bonding to make that tooth look proportional. I think you'll have more success with that than trying to extrude, and the outcome, cosmetic outcome, will look much better. I have several cases I can share where I've done this and um, used a optimized flow. I have that presentation published in um, a Latin nation. I'd like to put that on YouTube as well. Um, <clears throat> the next rule, the next law is power ridges for root torque. Now Barry Glaser noted that power ridges, A, they work, but they work less effectively when they're placed on contiguous teeth, meaning teeth next to each other. And for many cases, let's say for a class 2 div 2 case where both the central incisors are tipped lingually. Um, we need to root torque lingually uh, in order to correct that. They'll put two power ridges adjacent. And what we found is that the power ridges, when they're on contiguous teeth, the plastic lifts off the two teeth and is less effective. So it is better sometimes to alternate them and to say, put the power ridge on number eight on a liner one through nine and on 10 through 20. For example, put it on number nine, and you might get more effective use of the power ridges. That said, power ridges help, and they're a tremendous uh, thermoplastic feature to lingualize the roots. No other aligner system that I've seen has that feature besides Invisalign. Now, you need to know that when this is prescribed on your ClinCheck, the patient can experience discomfort because the aligner plastic sits off the teeth just a little bit and their upper lip does rub on that plastic. They're also a little bit uncomfortable and they, you can see them slightly on the teeth. Um, John Morton published this slide and he looked at um, you know, 12,000 upper incisors and 14,000 about uh, lower incisors and with cases with lingual root torque prescribed, an average of 7.4 degrees, um, root torque power ridges uh, increased success or were better in 500% of the cases. This is pretty substantial. This is a large group study. And um, using scans and, and revisions, he was able to really dive deep and fi figure that this was a very important feature. I mean, to acquire 7.4 degrees of lingual root torque is not easy. That's a difficult movement for braces, for Invisalign, whatever. Um, another cool thing, if you have, let's say, for example, you have a scissor bite where the incisors are tipped, let's say these are the lower teeth and the tip back, and you have to procline the incisors forward. Proclination, you don't need power ridges, but if you're trying to tip the roots back, on all four teeth, it's difficult. You can get some benefit from placing an HBEV rectangular gingival um, attachment on the facial instead of a power ridge. That does provide a little bit of a uh, root torquing feature to the plastic. And now John Morton did not test that versus power ridges, but I found in my practice 
that is an alternative to a power ridge. And the last law is to use the template aligner when putting on attachments. Um, this is kind of a no-brainer for some. Invisalign sends an aligner, it has a T on it, and that T uh, printed on the aligner means template. The aligners have either a T, a U, or an L. I'm sorry, a T, an N, or an O. There is uh, the patient ID number, U meaning upper, L meaning lower. Then it will say N for a normal aligner, that means an active aligner, T for template aligner, or O for overcorrection aligner. The only aligner used to put smart attachments on is the template aligner. And that is because the active aligners, the, the uh, normal and overcorrection, have a dimple in them. And that dimple uh, is used to engage the smart surface. And if you use that aligner to place the template on, that uh, attachment will no longer have an active surface. It's very important. Now that said, for non-smart attachments, the regular attachments, you can use a normal aligner. You can also, when refining, leave on your normal attachments because they're there for anchorage and not for uh, specific force vectors. Based on what we learned with uh, Scott Frey's slide, the uh, regular attachments provide little to no um, help with specific vectors of movement, and that regular attachments help with anchorage and anchorage only. So if you are using attachments in your case, let's say you're using another aligner system, let's say clear correct, and they don't have smart attachments, the only benefit you're getting from the attachments is anchorage. You're not getting smart features. And then <clears throat> for refinements, again, you can leave on your attachments if they are non-smart, but you need to take off the smart attachments because you're going to have to re-put them back on with your template aligner at, when you deliver your refinement. I hope that's clear. The laws, again, one through five, I won't read them. You have them right here. And guys, if you want a copy of this presentation, a PDF, I'm happy to send it to you. Um, leave comments, email me, robinbethel at gmail.com or on Facebook. Happy to send them. I got to give a shout out to the people who influenced my theory. And these people have all been so open and generous with their uh, information. Uh, obviously, Dr. Galler and Dr. Ostriker, a lot of my colleagues have been... Um, American Academy of Clear Aligning Doctors and Gallerites. Um, he's given a lot of information, the Go chart specifically. Dr. Randy Kunick for being a pioneer orthodontist, just like Dr. Ostriker, for training and being patient with dentists. Um, Dr. Barry Glaser wrote the first book about Invisalign theory, read a pioneer, fantastic human being. If you have an opportunity to find him on Facebook or give him a shout out, uh, he's got a lot of information. He also has a podcast. Um, called the, um, I don't remember, Aligner Podcast, look it up. Uh, John Morton's video is phenomenal. It's kind of in the depths of the internet, but you can find it on our Facebook page. And then uh, my peers and mentors in my practice um, learned a lot and continue to learn there. And I hope that we all continue in the spirit of giving and collaboration, share with each other to get our 10,000 hours of experience so that we can provide the best outcome for our patients. Little soapbox, people complain about direct to consumer. Um, we created direct to consumer by not performing optimally for our patients and allowing general dentists and dental professionals to learn this stuff. Because most of our patients come to us and are thinking about aligners and we aren't able to offer solutions because we don't know what we're doing and we're not practiced at this. So I want to change that. Anyway, guys, um, I really appreciate what everyone's done and what uh, you guys for watching this video. Please share it with your friends and colleagues. <clears throat> I do have a case here I'd like to show and you guys can watch if you like. Let's exit this presentation here. I have a clinch check. This one was shared with me um, through Aligner Nation. Uh, this case came in pretty much uh, attachments on every upper tooth besides the molars. We have anchorage attachments, we have double spike, root torquing attachments, and we have optimized extrusion attachments on every incisor. 
we see this patient's class 3, and we see molar distalization on the left side, none on the right, and flaring of the incisors, ideally for a restorative final outcome. Um, <clears throat> what's wrong with these attachments? Well, A, extrusion attachments with no extrusions prescribed, they do nothing. So they can be completely removed. So in this case, I would first look at the forces prescribed and the outcome, and I could tell you all these need to be taken off from 7 through 11. The lower arch, um, number 25, has an extrusion attachment as well. You can remove that. 22 with 4 degrees, I'd remove the rotation attachments on 4 and 27. Um, and then I would analyze whether or not we want to distalize, in a class 3 case, distalize the upper molars. There are very few cases I would distalize molars on. I'm of the philosophy that the maxilla belongs forward for airway, and um, that is my theory. And if I can avoid distalizing molars, I do. This uh, doctor, who is awesome, submitted photos. And um, let me see if I have a copy. Here is the patient photos. Um, you can see class 3 small laterals in the patient's face, the profile. I would not say that this person is, um, they're not prognathic, their chin is not too far forward. I would not say this is a skeletal need for a, um, you know, orthognathic surgery to bring the chin back. I would say that the maxilla could come forward. Now, when you procline the incisors, you will give a little lip lift, but I would definitely eliminate the distalization of the molars in this case. And by doing that, all we need to do is procline and expand the maxilla a little bit, leave spaces, and then there's a debate over the mandible. Um, we could do IPR to bring some of these lower teeth back to provide some space between the teeth, uh, excuse me, to provide some overjet to protect our final veneers. We could even extract uh, number 25, tip these teeth to close that space and um, get some overjet. There's a lot of ways to look at it. There's not really a wrong answer, but this clincheck can certainly be made easier. This was a good example here. Another thing you want to be careful about with these cases is you don't want to translate the roots of the incisors buccally too much. I mean, they are showing 1.3, 1.4. There is a maxillary plate there that's not going to want to... Um, it's not going to budge. We can't grow maxillary bone in adults easily. There's debate to whether that's possible at all. But you can expand the arch. You can expand um, in the bicuspids, and you can get space mesial and distal and extract a lower incisor to make room for those beautiful veneers. Anyway, guys, it's a great case. Thank you so much for following. More to come. The more you share, the more you comment, uh, the more we can grow. Um, and share with one another and get momentum behind us so that more are willing to share information. Thank you guys. Have a great night. See you later.